Hello and welcome to WYTV7. My name is Byron Pettit. I am the host of Family Matters. Family Matters airs every Thursday at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The mission of Family Matters is to educate, empower, and encourage. My hope is every Thursday when you tune in that you find something that will cause you to make a change in your life or the lives of others. Today, I'm excited to have a guest who is what I consider an expert or has great insight on not only leadership, but positivity as well. He is a father, he is a husband, an educated man, he is a author. I like a welcome to the show today, Dr. Ken Morton. Thank you, Mr. Byron Pettit. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me and I look forward to our conversation. All right. So Dr. Morton, as you know, what I talk about is family matters, issues in regards to family. From your perspective, just define to us what you would uh, consider a family. Well, how would you define a family? I would describe the family, I will describe the family in a couple of ways. Most of us, when we hear the word family, we think of the nuclear unit. And if we think about a household, you know, there are typically adults in the household. We, we haven't gone quite to the place where kids are running the, the place on their own yet. Sometimes you see stories that may make you think otherwise, but typically there's one or two adults uh, at the head of the family, the nuclear family in the household. But from a social perspective, we have, we use that word also to describe sometimes the organizations or the circles that we run in. Uh, many times you will hear someone say, well, this is my work family, or this is my workout family, or, you know, this is my church family. But typically it is that organization, that unit, that structure, structure that is composed of individuals that have sometimes common blood, common interests, common causes. That is, that is really my definition of a family. And I even use family interchangeably and in different ways. I talk about my my physical family, my wife, my daughter, my siblings, uh, my parents when they were alive, that is one family. But I also have you know, a, a family of colleagues at work or social order families. And that's really the unit that comes to mind for many uh, when they hear the word and use the word family. Okay, okay. What I wanna do is you mentioned not only the work family, the nuclear family, but also I've known you before you became a doctor. So talk to, the audience about what it was like from your perspective, how it impacted your family when you decided to say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna go back and get my doctorate because that probably tends to shift the responsibilities within the home. So talk, talk about what that, what that journey was like um, and what you went and got your doctorate in. Yeah, so I went back, I returned to school. Let, let me start back, let me rewind just a little bit to, to let you know how I got here. When I was an undergrad, many, many, many years ago, once I got done with my, I can't even call it a four-year degree, my five-year degree, I said to myself, Ken, I'm never going to do that to myself again. And about 10 years later, I got the, the notion to go ahead and get my master's degree, and I did that. It was very different. I think a lot of it had to do with my maturity level. I was ready for that. And then some years after that, I decided to get my doctorate. Of course, at that point, I had a family. I was married. My daughter was born. She was very young. My family served as a, a tremendous support role for me in helping me to make that decision. It was something that I felt like I was doing for my family on behalf of my family in the name of my family. So it wasn't, it was never just about me or never just about a credential that I could get for myself. I wanted to set a good example for my family and particularly for my daughter to show her and to be a, an in the house example of what one could do when he, he being me, set my mind to it. So my family was very instrumental in supporting me. As much as they did, I made a commitment to myself. Taking on a doctoral program is no small undertaking. But I really tried not to interrupt many of the family, as many of the family routines as I could as possible. Now, fortunately for me, that journey was a bit easy. As you know, Byron, I'm a night owl. You know, yeah. you'll get a text from me 
one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Sometimes you'll see it the next morning, but I'm also an early bird. That really helped me because it enabled me to stay engaged with my family, which was ultimately important and still is during what I would call the waking hours of the day. And then when things settle down, family would go to sleep. That's when I hit the books hard. Truthfully, there were some mornings that as I was wrapping up working on either my dissertation or coursework, I was starting to hear the birds sing outside the very next morning. But that was that was not on my family, that was on me. And because I'm a short sleeper, that worked out for me. It's probably not a path I would recommend for everyone. It just happened to work for me. But my family was my cornerstone, my support system. They were the ones that when I would hit a period of frustration, they would hear me. Even my daughter, as young as she was, she didn't always understand, but she understood the gravity of what I was going through and supported me. And many times at the kitchen table, she was on one side doing her homework. I was on the other side working on my thesis. And I tried to make it a family affair and a family event as much as possible. Okay. Yeah. And one thing I want the readers, uh, the listeners to say is you are really skilled in understanding money and you work in banking. So talk to the audience again, how you decided to into writing books in regards to positivity, as well as leadership. Like majority of folks are so let me just go back and get a doctorate in finance or you know, I, I got a master's in psychology. So for me to say, hey, Ken, I'm gonna go and get a, a master's in numbers. Not saying I couldn't do that, but what drove you to say, hey, numbers is what I do, but leadership is where my interest lies. Yeah, good question, uh, Byron. My, my undergrad major was in finance, as you, you probably know, and then my master's was in management. Over the course of my career, the better part of my career, I have always been drawn to and pulled into conversations around leadership, studying leadership models, how to be a good leader, things that I should look for as a leader, things that I should avoid. Early in my career, even before I went into banking, I had a, a management level job. I, I was a unit manager in one of the uh, retail outlets at 24 years old. Day one, I had associates or, or fellow team members that were in their mid 50s or approaching 60s. So very early on, I, I was thrust into leadership roles and had to figure out as I was still growing and maturing, how do I be this leader? How do, how do I lead other people? And how do I have conversations, address performance issues and exhibit many of the behaviors that a leader should show? Over the years as that evolved, when I did decide to go back and get my doctorate, which was a, a DBA, Doctor of Business Administration, it was natural for me to, to gravitate towards the leadership track to take me deeper into learning uh, how as a scholar practitioner, how do I learn the technical backgrounds of leadership beyond just reading? Many of us read a lot and there's so much out there. Leadership is a subject that has been written about in so many different ways, forms and fashions. Of course, it's not all good just because it's in print or just because it's on the internet doesn't make it golden. However, my curiosity and my desi desire to go deeper into the realm of leadership and understanding, you know, how do I be a good leader? What are some of the practices, uh, the things that I need to apply? That was my interest and that's what took me down uh, the leadership pipe. Okay, and you mentioned when you were uh, at the table doing your work and Camden was sitting across from you doing uh, her work as well. What were some of the challenges, if there were any, uh, that a leader would face in the home? Because like you said, you're doing one thing, she's doing another. Were there challenges that you faced in regards to being a leader within your home um, to get that doctorate? Oh, definitely, definitely. One of, the, one of the greatest challenges is knowing when to wear what hat. Mm. And what I mean by that is it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And I mean this in a good way. Your children seem to see you authentically, and they should. You, you, you're in the home, you're dad. They don't, early on, they don't necessarily understand what that, what that diploma, what that degree on the wall looks like. And now as they grow older, they come into a greater appreciation of that. But early on, as I'm sitting there doing my work and sometimes frustrated, and my, my daughter was doing her work and sometimes frustrated, Early on, I don't think she really had the concept of what I was doing, but she did know I was doing schoolwork. And she did know that 
sometimes as much as she didn't want to be there doing her work, I probably felt the same. When I, I'll go back to the statement I made about knowing what hat. Sometimes you have to put that hat on and you are that leader. And then sometimes you just need to be dad. Uh, you know, your kids aren't looking for any deep leadership explanation, any deep theory, anything like that. And I have learned, and my daughter has done an, a great job over the years of teaching me, there's sometimes that I want to go off into this long, drawn out tirade about the who, what, where, when, and why of an event or why people do certain things. But I've learned sometimes I've had about 10 or 15 or 20 seconds to get my message out. And it's amazing how my daughter, my wife, my family has taught me many things about communication, about listening, about modeling the right behaviors. And there are times that you really can't separate. Sometimes you're wearing two or three hats at the same time. It's not a binary choice where you wear one or the other. So it's just a matter of the evolution. And as she continued to grow, and as I continue to go further, I learned a lot about myself as a leader. I learned outside of the home how I needed to be a leader, but I learned also a lot about inside of the home, the things that I needed to do, the behaviors I needed to display. And there's no better accountability point. As you know, you have children yourself. Wow, it's easy to talk the talk, but you have to walk the walk. And when you have a set of eyes that are on you as, as much as she is awake, that's a great accountability point and it makes you think. And I know for me, that made me a better parent and continues to make me a better leader. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Something you brought up also earlier when you were defining the family perspective. And when we talk about, for me, sometimes when you hear nuclear family, for me, I tend to associate with a two-parent household because I grew up with a two-parent household, but that's not always the case. For the listening folks uh, on this show today, when you talk about leadership, how do you look at it from a standpoint, whether you're a two-parent household or a single-parent parent household, and what are the challenges that you think folks are um, facing if I'm a single-parent household trying to be a leader, trying to go to work, trying to uh, parent children? Um, what's some of the problems you see with that, whether two-parent household or a single-parent household? Yeah, great question. I think there are some common challenges, whether there are one parent, single parent, two parents, five parents, 10 parents. To a certain extent, the number doesn't lessen the challenge. I think sometimes when there are multiple parents and each parent has a role or sometimes those roles overlap, it may make it easier from that perspective because you know the old, the old adage, two sets of eyes are better than one. There are some situations whereby if there is a single parent, it's nothing negative or nothing wrong with that situation. However, one person sometimes can get so stretched and have so many balls that they have to keep in the air or have so many things that they have to do, they may be at a disadvantage. Whereas if there were another set of eyes to help see things, help support and, and reinforce messaging, sometimes that works. But there are some amazing, as you know, there are some amazing single family or single parent households that from a leadership, from a supervision perspective, from an awareness perspective, that can run circles around some multiple parent households. And that happens all day long, 24 seven, 365, that happens. I think it's less, sometimes it's less about the number and more about the capability of the, of the person that is the parent or the person that is in charge particularly when there are children or youth involved. There has to be some leadership, some guidance, some messaging, someone to set standards, someone to set accountability. The unfortunate part is there are many parents sometimes that are still on that, still on that journey themselves. And it puts them in a situation where they're trying to figure it out at the same time they're trying to lead someone who's younger, someone who's looking up to them uh, to be that role model, to, to show them what it's like to go through certain situations and how you need to think about things. Just because you're chronologi chronologically a parent doesn't mean you're an expert at everything. And many, many of us, even years into our quote unquote adulthood life, we're still learning, we're still growing. And you know, the challenge is how do I pull that off and how do I execute that as a leader? Well, whether it's just me or whether it's me, 
one person and a partner, it takes a lot of coordination, it takes listening, it takes flexibility, it takes a lot of different skill sets. And I think those are some of the, the common challenges, whether it's one person or two, that that leader or that parent will have to learn how to navigate. Again, particularly if there are children involved. Yeah, a great point. I think also part of that on top of that is like you said, there's amazing, some amazing single parent households doing an excellent job. I think it's also the buy-in the buy-in that's being given to a single, to, from a single parent household to a child, or it's the culture of the environment of the home as well. So let's do this. We're gonna go to break. And when we come back, I wanna talk to you more in regards to the books that you have written, as well as what's your thought in regards to like social media, the pandemic and how it's impacting people in regards to their positivity during this time. Great, thank you. Calling all HBCU alumni, supporters, and golfers. It's that time of year again. Yes, the HBCU. Swing into their dreams charity golf tournament on Tuesday, April 5th. If you missed the last one, you have time once again to be epic. Don't miss the golf tournament of the year. The Swing Into Their Dreams HBCU Charity Golf Tournament at the Atlanta National Golf Club in Milton, Georgia, Tuesday, April the 5th. Registration begins now. Sign up your golf teams at swingintotheirdreams.com. That's swingintotheirdreams.com. Or call 770-686-7148. That's 770-686-7148. Don't miss it. Hello. Welcome back to Family Matters. I'm your host, Byron Pettit. I'm here with Dr. Kim Morton today, and today he's talking in regards to leadership and the role of positivity within leadership. Dr. Morton, you know, I had the opportunity, and within my household, we have your book, which is called The Positive Leader, Reflections and Motivations. So can you see that? Is that clear? Okay. Yes. So we've had that in our home. My boys have read it, and each and every night, they would go through the best that they can at their age group and tell us about what that chapter was about. And they've done a good job. And I appreciate the way that you book. It was easy. It's easy application. Um, for those who buy the book, they'll be like, this is something I could take away and use right in my life um, um, at the very moment. But what I want to do, I want you to kind of talk about what does faith or how does faith play within a role in leadership within the home? Yeah, so, so let me touch upon faith. Faith from a, you can look at faith on a very, what I would call a very uh, topical level. You know, faith is really what do you believe in? You know, what is it that compels you to act, behave in a certain way? What are your guiding principles? And now, now the thing about faith, and if you look at it from a biblical perspective, it is the belief in those things unseen. If you can see it and just reach out and grab it and just touch it and do it, typically that is that is a lesser degree of faith. But real faith and faith that gets tested, and I'll bring it back to the leadership and family piece, that real faith that gets tested is when you are in situations or you are up against something that you cannot see, when it's foggy, when it's cloudy, when all you know is there's one step in front of you that you can make but you're expected to make the step after that and you can't see it and you're expected to make the step after that. That is real faith and that's faith in action. Faith is beyond just the belief because again, back, back to a biblical perspective, faith without works is dead. So you can't just believe, you have to take action. And that same plays out in a practical everyday life. We can have faith, we can believe in certain things, but at some point we have to get up off of what I would call the couch of belief and get out and do something based upon that faith. So when we, when we think about our goals, when we think about just the family unit, many of us have a vision or we should all have a vision of what it looks like when my family is successful, when it looks, what it looks like when my partner, my spouse, my children, my parents, my grandparents, my cousins. I mean, sometimes we have some big families. What does it look like when that family is doing well, when it's functioning well, when it's communicating well? 
Sometimes it's very easy, but then there are other times when we meet challenges that we have to have the faith that's going to get us through. We may not have it all figured out today, but we have to have the faith that we're going to keep stepping and we're going to keep believing and we're going to keep acting. We're not just going to sit back and say, oh, I hope or I wish or, you know, let me keep my fingers crossed. That's not faith. That's just a, and can be an empty statement, but you've got to believe and you have to take action within that belief and action towards that belief. That's exercising your faith. And I think that's 100% applicable to the family unit when we, when we want good things and good success for our families and those members that are within our families. Okay. Okay. You and I see the same thing in regards to the media, the television. What, what sort of, if there's any sort of quality role models that are being shown within the media when it comes to leadership? Where are you at on that? What are you seeing in regards to it being shown? Wow, well, we, we need another whole segment on the media because it the media, bad, good, or indifferent, covers so much ground. And you have to, you know, so there's no, let's take the internet as one form of media. There's no good internet. There's no bad internet. There's no in-between internet. It's all out there. Some people call it the wild, wild west. It really is. When it comes to the, to the media and messaging, we have to be very good stewards of what we open ourselves up to. Images, music, messaging. Uh, there's a term out there that I don't, don't even think was really around a few years ago, influencers. Influencers is a very big deal now. In fact, the major influencers, they have such a grand effect upon society at large through social media that there are companies that will pay to be on their sites and pay them to, to have their logo as logo posted on the site of an influencer. As a leader, many of the, the messaging that takes place and, and many of the things that we want to guard against, in some instances, it's always been there, but social media makes it immediate. Immediate for adults, definitely immediate, immediate for children, for youth, those that are impressionable, so you have to up your game when it comes to helping others navigate through social media. And to be honest, sometimes we have to up our games to help ourselves navigate through social media. There's just so much out there. And it's not all bad. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's not all bad. But you have to have what I would call a spirit, a level of discernment to understand what are those sites I need to stay away from? What are those things that I know mean no good for me? Though all these images are coming at me a million miles an hour, what is a filter that I have on myself or on my household that will prevent certain things from coming into my space that I don't want in my space? Or maybe I want it, but I know it's not healthy for me. So there's some things that I need to avoid. From a leadership perspective, that, that's an ongoing dilemma that we have to deal with. And we all... So, you know, we all we all are leaders. It's not just the oldest person in the house. So it's not just the, just the oldest person on the team. Even children are expected to be leaders within their respective circles. We have to help them, but we have to help ourselves also navigate the wild, wild west in terms of what's out there in terms of social media, those platforms, those messaging, the messaging that they're trying to get at all of us with. Uh, we have to understand are we going to willfully participate or where do I need to shut it down and step away, which is okay. Yeah, you in couple, there's two chapters within your book. One talks about words matter and you kind of touched on that in regards to the social media and the internet, whatever sort of media form platform we look at, words matter. But to also talk within one of you, I think it's chapter seven, your book called, uh, Positivity requires persistence. And yes. from a leadership perspective, again, I'm, I'm thinking about when you said you were fortunate enough to be in management at a young age. So you were around successful people who were in positions of management that kind of, kind of, kind of, I can say, kind of lit the fire in you to say, hey, this might be a route that I want to go. Talk about positivity and how it requires persistence, because sometimes we can get um, a burst of energy and want to be a part of and go our way and then we say I'll forget it I give up 
So talk about what that persistence and why it's important to be successful um, in anything that you do. Absolutely. As we know, life will throw some stuff at us. There's some challenges. There's some things that we have to overcome. Sometimes it's an event. Sometimes it's people. Sometimes it's a combination of people and events. As, as enthusiastic, as, as passionate as we may be about around what we want to do, how we want to do it, how we want to, to be that leader, how we want to be that person, whether it's a leadership role or not, we all meet challenges. Particularly for a leader, we have to understand, and, and here's where persistence comes into play. There are very few of us on this earth that do things and execute 100% correctly the very first time without challenges, without hardship, without, I mean, there, there are tons of analogies you can, you can throw at this dilemma, you know, pushing the ball uphill, all of that. It's not a matter of when some, if something happens, it's a matter of when something happens that potentially can get you off track. That's where as a leader, you have to be persistent. And, and it's more than just that word persistent. Persistent meaning that you're gonna continue at it. You're gonna continue pushing, you're gonna push your way through. But there are so many other adjectives that come to mind as well. You have to stay committed to your purpose. You have to stay on task. You have to be resilient. We get knocked down many times, but the key is you can't stay down. And that's where that attitude of positivity comes in. You understand and you accept that there are gonna be some things that are gonna come your way that you didn't plan on it, you didn't have it on your radar screen, maybe you didn't even foresee it. But when it happens, it's not fatal. That's where that attitude of gratitude comes in, the gratitude saying, I'm not where I need to be, but I'm thankful for where I am thus far. And I'm going to keep at it and I'm going to be resilient. I'm going to keep my commitment. I'm going to stay persistent. And if you look at it from a spiritual perspective, you have to understand that our time and God's time for getting something done many times are two different calendars. We frustrate ourselves when we expect to see something in the next minute or tomorrow. But it's humbling. You have to step back. And if you are a believer, someone that believes that you know, God is holding, holding your purpose and holding your path, as well as holding the timing, you have to step back and, and, and understand that if, you, if that is what you believe, then you've got to buy into the fact that he knows better than you. I can say for myself, there are some things that I have wanted to do. There have been some things that I have prayed for. There have been some things that I thought it was just the ne next natural step for it to happen for me in my life. I am glad that it didn't happen at the time that I thought it should have because, you know, if you, if you want to call it a blessing, sometimes when you get what you want, when you're not ready for it, it does you no good and you will mishandle and misappropriate what you've been given. It's, it's a balancing act and it's not easy because for me, I get impatient. And when I get fixated and hone in on something, I'm ready to go get it, I am ready. But I'm not always as ready as I think I am. So from a practical perspective, from a faith perspective, we have to be flexible enough to understand that if it's meant for me, there's nothing and no one on this earth that can keep it from me. And there's some things that I may think of for me that I am just not even supposed to have. So I'm thankful for the things that are that come my way at the right time. And looking back over my life, I am so thankful that there's some things that I thought I wanted at times in the past that I did not get. Because had I got them, I doubt if we'd be sitting here right now having this conversation. <laughs> right, right, right. I just have to keep it 100% transparent. And that's what we want here. I appreciate that. So, Dr. Morgan, I want to ask you one more question before the remaining time we have. But I also want to give you um, the opportunity to, to express how we get a hold of you and how to get a hold of your books. But you talked about persistence and you also talked to I think for me, sometimes persistence is staying the course. But also in staying the course, sometimes uh, you meet failure. Yes. Talk to us about how failure is an effective teacher. OK. Failure, the school of failure is when, when we think about the great institutions of the world, Oxford, Harvard, MIT, Caltech, 
Georgia Tech, whatever school you want to name. That, that's academic excellence. Failure is should be named among those great institutions of learning and teaching. Mm -hmm. There is so much to be learned, and many, many subscribe to the notion that there is more to be learned out of failure than out of success. If we just went through life and nothing was ever a challenge and we never failed, we would get a false sense of who we are, we get a false sense of what we can do, and we would never get stretched and challenged. There's a book, uh, Good to Great, I, I can't think of the name of the author right now, but if we never fail, we may just settle on being good. Well, being good may be okay, but you never get to great if you don't meet challenges, if you don't fail, if you get, and the good thing about fail, if there is a good thing about failure, failure is the opportunity to learn and get feedback and to understand being resilient, being persistent. As I come back at this thing again, what do I need to apply this time that I've learned out of failure that I did not know the first time around? Failure can be such a, it is, not, not can be, failure is such a great teacher. For those that are into pop culture, Star Wars, even the great Yoda quotes, failure, the ultimate teacher it is. And I'll paraphrase a little bit. I, Yoda says so much, I can't remember everything he says. <laughs> but, even, but even in his knowledge at 800 years old, training Jedi knights or, or younglings to become Jedi, he understood and appreciated, and I know that's Hollywood, but let's bring it into 2022. We have to acknowledge and understand that failure is a marvelous teacher. Now, we don't want to perpetually fail, but when you do fall down, when you do fail, the key is to get the lesson, to understand why you fail, why this failure is teaching you what it is and what can you do differently or sometimes some failures can be so catastrophic. It's not a matter of going back and trying it over again. It's a matter of, wow, I should never have tried that in the first time, first, first time around. Failure just has so many dynamics to it. It is so valuable. We have to acknowledge, embrace that there's going to be some failure along the way, but I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to get better. I'm going to be persistent. And throughout, whether I'm at the top of the mountain or whether I'm getting up from getting knocked down, I'm going to maintain my positivity. I'm going to think about all of the possibilities, what I can do. I'm not going to focus on the things that I don't have or the things that I cannot do. And my lens for life is going to keep me moving forward. That's what's key, even in the midst of failure, and particularly in the midst of failure. Thank you. Thank you. So failure is just part of the process. It's a long Absolutely. journey to be successful. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Important. Thank you for the opportunity for you to come on today and talk about positivity, talk about from a family leadership perspective as well. For the listening audience and for the viewers, how can we get in contact? You first tell us about the books where we can get your book. Um, and also, if folks were to say, I need to talk to Dr. Morton um, directly, how do folks get a hold of you? Great. Thank you. Let me talk about the books at first. My, I'm going to go down a short list here. My first book was Defined by Attitude, The Power of Positivity. I published this one in 2017, and that really kicked it off and helped, helped me to jump into the arena talking about the things that I saw, the things that I saw from a positivity perspective, but also some things that I challenge you my reader to think about. I know it's a little bit uh, yes. okay. glossy there. But, it, but in the book, I, I, I not only present se several things around the power of positivity and the power that attitude has to take you forward down your, your chosen path of life. That was the first. And then a couple of years after that, after the first book, it dawned upon me that I did not want to just get people excited about the power of positivity. I needed to provide some tools. That led me to produce my journal, the Your 365 Day Journal of Positive Affirmations and Com Commitments. This takes you day by day through either making an affirmation about where you are in your life, things that you're doing, or also a commitment around something that you want to do. The framework is set up such that as you go day by day, it becomes a journey not just my words, but you're capturing what made you successful on that particular day. So when you meet that same challenge down the road, you can go back, open your journal, take a look at some of the things that you did 
maybe self conversations that you had or activities that you engaged in that helped you move beyond that particular challenge. The book that you held up, uh, Byron, which is the same one I have, is uh, The Positive Leader Reflections and Motivations. Again, it takes you down, continue down that road of exploring leadership, positivity, and how do we maximize both within our lives. Okay. Now, Dr. Morton, how do people get a hold of you directly? I need to call Dr. Morton. I need a word from him today. Is there a website, email, phone number? Absolutely. My email address is info at infinityleadershipconsulting.org. My personal email address is onekennethmorton at gmail.com. And my website for my company, Infinity Leadership Consulting, is www.infinityleadershipconsulting.org. Okay. Thank you. Again, we thank you for coming on the show for the information that you bless us with. I hope in the future, if I reach out to you again, you'd be more than willing to come back on. Thank you. Thanks for having me this morning. Okay. So if you enjoyed the show, Family Matters, please go back to site and donate, wytv7.org and hit the, hit the subscribe button, like button. And if you want to donate, there's a donating button there as well. If you need to get a hold of me, Byron Pettit, you can contact me at www.practicalfamilyresolutions.com or you can email me at familyresolutions at gmail.com. If you personally need to get a hold of me and you'd like to be on the show, contact me at 704-288-4612. Again, we thank you for tuning in and have a great day. Thank you.